Good morning, I'm Bob Jankowski, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are a religious community who commit ourselves to diversity. We hope to nourish human differences, those of gender, race, age, ability, sexual orientation, political views, culture, class, and religious belief. Welcome to all who treasure freedom of conscience in the search for truth. We promise to do our best to provide you with a spiritual home. We extend a special welcome to our visitors today. We hope you follow our Facebook page. To participate in Zoom and receive announcements about special events and our religious exploration classes, please sign up for our weekly email. There should be a link in the comments section of our Facebook page where you can sign up. I'd like to draw your attention to recent announcements. For those in person, they are printed in your order of service. There are links in the UUC newsletter and weekly UU connections for those watching online today. And I don't think there are any extra announcements, so thank you all for joining us, joining us in person or online today.
Good morning, especially to our Facebook and Zoom folks. We welcome all of you. First of all, my name is not Kathy Pierce, as in your program. I'm Phil Swanhorst, go by he or him, and I'm representing the Social Responsibilities Committee here to introduce our 5050 recipient for the month of January. It is the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. Headquartered in Boston, it works closely with the UUA. One family, the Sharps, began smuggling Jews out of Europe during World War II. They were forced to leave for the United States where they became UU members, and the committee was formed. Their work now continues to advance human rights by promoting lasting system change around the globe. To effect system change, our new or better policy is needed in several areas. This, this year, UUSC continues to work on reversing current anti-immigration policies including ending most detentions and providing a path for citizenship for immigrants who were raised in this country. UUSC also works with groups focusing on policies affecting climate change, including being on the ground floor with Honor the Earth, partners to protect Line 3, a pipeline extension across native lands. Another priority is changing the international justice system, particularly by advocating the U.S. government to take steps to hold the Burmese military accountable for the 2017 genocide against the Royoya ethnic minority and support international efforts to seek justice for this crime. Many of our partner groups and the committees in which they work desperately need help to protect worker health during this pandemic. The UUSC Board of Directors voted in 2021 to release from reserves the funds necessary to provide masks, wash water, and other necessary gear to allow them to stay working on site throughout this pandemic crisis. We thank you and ask you for your continued support. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Eau Claire. I'm the Reverend Virginia Wolf, Minister Emerita of this congregation. My pronouns are she, her, hers. On this second day of 2022, I'm so happy to be here with you in person and on Zoom and Facebook. This morning we're going to explore the intention of cultivating goodwill or kindness, not just for those that we love, but for everyone. Let us begin with this poem by Baron Wormser, celebrating, he celebrates the relationship between kindness and joy. I rise before the sun does. Each morning I sit on the edge of my bed with my feet planted on the unlovely linoleum floor. And I say slowly, but quite distinctly to the darkness, sweet joy befall thee. I feel like an actor speaking the first words of a play, except my life is no play, nor does my soul need an audience. What I do need is confidence. I've built my life up from very shaky ground 
and William Blake, the man who wrote that line, has been a godsend to me. The human voice that speaks a poem rises from a powerful well. We take it for granted, but a voice is an advent of spirit. I know from attending numerous churches during my haphazard childhood that the joy that preachers trumpet comes in a box with grievous dimensions. Their salvation is a machine of wrath. They break your back on hell so you can get to heaven. The joy I invoke can go where it chooses because it resides in our being alive. The joy I invoke is Blake's Jerusalem, the city we can build each day through kindness. The most sublime act is to set another before you. Come, let us worship. Please join us in saying the words for lighting the chalice. We light, light this chalice, chalice to kindle the warmth of kindness, its comfort, its healing, its powers to transform our lives. May this kindness spread and heal a suffering world. I'm Wilma Clark. I will read a poem called Kindness by Naomi Shehab Nye. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted, and carefully saved, all this must go, so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness, how you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then, it is only sign, then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for. And then, it goes with you everywhere, like the shadow or a friend. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
This is the time in our service for giving. We give thanks for the gifts given today, our caring for each other and our material goods. May this offering be a blessing to friends and strangers, neighbors all. Each Sunday we give half of all non-pledge donations to nonprofit organizations that work to help others. And Phil told us all about the people who are getting it this month. It's the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. You may give cash or make checks payable to the UUC and indicate on the memo line whether it is for a pledge payment or for today's 50-50 recipient. You may scan to donate or text to give 84321. Checks may also be mailed to the UUC. With gratitude for the abundance in our lives, we give to help people in need and to support the work of this congregation. The greeters will pass the baskets around the sanctuary today for the first time since we've reopened. The offering will now be given and gratefully received. Let's read together the congregational response. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. I'm Erna Kelly, and I am reading a poem by Michael Blumenthal, to, and the title is Be Kind. Not merely because Henry James said there were but four rules of life, be kind, be kind, be kind, be kind, but because it's good for the soul, and what's more, for others, 
It may be that kindness is our best audition for a worthier world. And despite the vagueness and uncertainty of its recompense, a bird may yet wander into a bush before our very houses. Gratitude may not manifest itself in deeds entirely equal to our own. Still, there is weather arriving from every direction. The feasts of famine and feasts of plenty may yet prove to be one. So why not allow the little sacrificial squinches and squigglas to prevail? Why not inundate the particular world with minute particulars? Dust certainly all our fate. So why not make it the happiest possible dust, a detritus of blessedness? Surely the hedgehog Furling and unfurling into its spiked little ball knows something that, with gentle touch and unthreatening tone, can inure to our benefit. Surely the wicked witches of our childhood have died, and from where they are buried, a great kindness has eclipsed their misdeeds. Yes, of course, in the end, so much comes down to privilege and its various penumbras, but too much of our unruly animus has already been wasted on reprisals. Too much of the unblessed air is filled with smoke from undignified fires. Oh, friends, take whatever kindness you can find and be profligate in its expenditure. It will not drain your limited resources, I assure you. It will not leave you vulnerable and unfurled with only your sweet little claws to defend yourselves and your wet little noses and your eyes to the ground and your little feet. Not long ago, I experienced an all-out attack on vaccinations and those who promote them. I was taken aback. During several water aerobic classes, I had talked cordially with a woman who spoke this harangue. We had visited about our dogs and kids. We tried to talk about food, only for me to find out that she's mostly a beef and potato person grimacing at the thought of eggplant and lamb. She had criticized Biden for his too rapid pullout from Afghanistan, but I was somewhat open to that opinion. Maybe I should have suspected that she is very conservative, but I didn't. An invitation to bring her dog to Fairfax Pool on its last open day initiated this rant. She said her dog wouldn't be welcome because she had not had her shots. When I asked why not, she, with increasing fervor, laid out her reasons for being, for being against vaccinations of any kind for her dog because one of her dogs died after getting the required shots, against the 64 inoculations she claimed her children were required to take for school, leaving one son sick for two days after the first round of shots, and against her husband's employer's insistence that he take the COVID-19 vaccinations or get tested and then isolate himself in the camper during the nights he was on the job site during the day. She's encouraging him to quit, even though she will need to go back to work to help support the family. I was flummoxed. I had so many contradictory responses that I couldn't think clearly. I did say I didn't believe that vaccinations were harmful most of the time, that certainly in my experience, they had prevented my children, dogs, me, and everyone I knew from getting the diseases they were meant to prevent. In response to her comments about school requirements, I, I indicated that I remembered many fewer inoculations, but she just kept laying out her complaints against vaccinations 
including that they cause autism. In the process, she discounted and talked over whatever I said. As I mostly listened, I could feel her desperation underneath her hostility. I was aware of the tentative connection we had formed before this explosion, even while feeling assaulted at the moment. My desire to get away grew until finally I told her I had to go and I left. Only later did I realize that this need to get away arose somewhat from my suppressed understanding that this woman was not vaccinated and thereby something of a threat to me. In my usual fashion, I have ruminated over this incident to see what I could learn. Not long ago, I wrote about my anger. Here was someone else's anger directed at me. I didn't want to get angry or to argue. I didn't want to be so invested in my opinions that I couldn't listen. I wanted to be kind and to have a conversation. And to some extent, I succeeded. But I was excruciatingly aware that I was out of my depth. My resistance to her opinions warred with my desire to feel compassion for her. Suddenly, someone who had seemed to be a potential friend felt like an enemy. To be sure, I've had experiences like this before, and in the past, I would have disputed her facts, argued passionately against her position, and have been ready to drop any possibility of a relationship with such a wrong-headed person. I have done so many times. But in my years as a Buddhist, I've been trying to learn a different way. I think this incident reflects me caught between my past habitual reactions and my new attempts to cultivate goodwill. Outwardly, I mostly didn't dispute her opinions. I didn't argue. I wasn't passionate. I didn't need to prove her wrong. But inwardly, I was appalled, and I'm sure my feelings, le feelings leaked out, and they for sure blocked me from relating to her with kindness and clarity. So how might I have related to her as I wish I had? The Buddhist answer is to cultivate goodwill so thoroughly that one is always centered in it, never giving fear, dislike, discomfort, anger, and other reactivity a chance to arise. Let's examine how to cultivate goodwill so fully that it becomes a way of life, but with this disclaimer. For most of us, it will never fully become a way of life. As I fumbled my account encounter with the woman in the pool, most of us will be imperfect in our attempts to act always out of goodwill. There's so much to overcome in order to act this way. First of all, there's our, our habitual response to perceive, perceived threats. When it seems someone might harm us, our survival instincts kick in, fight or flight. Years of conditioning reinforce these instincts. What's more, there can be a drama and energy and an excitement in giving into Instinctual, instinctual and habitual aggression into fighting. All of this is as true for the other person as it is for me. So even if I had acted out of goodwill, she might have reacted in harmful ways. As Thanissaro Bhikkhu says, when you really stop to think about all the beings in the cosmos, there are a lot of them who would react with suspicion and fear. They would rather be left alone Others might try to take unfair advantage reading your goodwill as a sign either of your weakness or of your endorsement of their views. For all of these reasons, sometimes the best way to maintain goodwill is to avoid the situation as I did with the woman in the pool. Although I was outwardly kind to her, I was very uncomfortable. My impulse to take her on conflicted with my desire not to be regress aggressive. And it, she repeatedly rejected what I said, and as she did so, the heat of the encounter seemed to increase. 
Now I realize it was because I was also afraid of her because she was unvaccinated. I didn't want to argue, but I didn't know what else to do, so I left. That was the best thing I could do in the moment, and perhaps the best thing in any moment. I'm not sure that I could have done anything that wouldn't have increased this woman's need to convince me that all vaccines are bad, period. But perhaps in some future moment, I might have had another response if I had sufficiently cultivated goodwill. Certainly the Buddhist teachings propose that this is true. Cultivating goodwill begins with the realization of how much ill will, that's irritation, frustration, anger, and hatred, costs me. I don't like how anger feels. I can get sucked up in the drama of being the person in the right who has been wronged, but I know this makes my heart race my body grow tense and my stomach knot up and it seldom leaves me feeling good even when I win the argument. Aggressive reactions harm or end relationships. Often I feel guilty that I reacted in such a way. I've learned that I do not want to feel ill will because negativity harms my body, emotions, and relationships. It's simply an ineffective response to others' aggression. Consider this saying, in the world, hate has never dispelled hate. Only love dispels hate. Often, Buddhists speak of loving kindness or metta as the antidote to hatred. Metta is one of my very favorite meditation practices. This usually involves sending loving kindness to myself and then a benefactor and then a neutral person, then a stranger, and finally an enemy. First I say, may I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be happy. May all my suffering deepen into wisdom and compassion, and may I know the joy of my true nature. Then I repeat those same words for a benefactor, and then a neutral person, and so forth, finishing last with the enemy. I've spent an hour a day at retreats practicing medit for a month and a half, and frequently when I'm upset, right today with myself or another, I stop and I repeat those phrases. My goal is to retrain myself, to, to develop an orientation of loving kindness. Another practice I was recently taught is to begin my meditation by holding someone that I dearly love in mind and feel my love for her or him arise and then to add person after person to this pool of love until I feel entirely filled. Some people find these practices too saccharine. Some Buddhist scholars dispute that loving kindness is a good translation of metta. They prefer friendliness or kindness or goodwill. With no knowledge of Pali or Pali or Sanskrit, I have to take their word for it, although I have no problem with the more common translation. Putting loving and kindness together allow me to separate this feeling from the more sentimental, sloppy, overly attached connotations of love so common in our culture. It seems to me that love and kindness are both characteristic of goodwill along with acceptance, investigation, compassion, generosity, forgiveness, and equanimity. Acceptance is always the first step. step. I must accept the wound and experience how it feels. I cannot presume that wounding will or should not happen. It's simply an unpleasant fact that people will mistreat me. 
I must, must let go of the view that things are so, so, supposed to be a certain way and challenge the belief that things should work out, that the world is perfectible. It's especially helpful if I can relax my sense of self, my sense that it was I or me who was offended, affronted, wounded. I must be as fully present and accepting of what is happening as I can be without obscuring the encounter with expectations or preconceptions of how reality is or should be. Finally, to do so, I must drop any idea that I know what the other person's intentions are or what motivates her. I felt attacked, but I can't say that she intended that result. Looking for good intentions, I might have had more empathy for her many bad experiences with vaccinations. I also see the value in turning from full acceptance to inspecting the underlying trigger, such as a sense of threat. In retrospect, I know I was threatened by her for, because I thought she was unvaccinated. I wish I'd been less foggy headed about being alarmed. Had I been clear headed, I might have said, I appreciate your mistrust of vaccinations, but if you have not had the COVID vaccination, I don't feel safe being close to you. And I might then have moved or left. Maybe since I am vaccinated, I should be less fearful. But at my age, I'm being very careful. My real question is, why didn't I see this underlying fear? It's as if I discounted it in the moment or feared she would be hurt or disbelieving. I'm sure she didn't intentionally mean to harm me. I understand now how much pain she felt about her negative experiences of vaccinations. Compassion for myself makes me not want to suffer from my own ill will, and so it can allow me to see people caught up in anger as suffering and to feel compassion. I didn't see the suffering of the woman in the pool at the time, but now, in retrospect, I can. She was tense, her eyes were narrowed, she was leaning toward me, talking loudly, and she couldn't let the issue of vaccinations go. It was obviously an obsession. What's more, I believe in the long-term in the long-term suffering caused by ill will. Another reason for empathy for this woman. The Buddhists call this karma. When I have a similar encounter in the future, I hope I will be able to look more at the hurt and less at the ire. I believe that will help me respond more calmly and empathetically than I did this time. Of all these qualities of goodwill, generosity is surely the most important. Dr. Rick Hansen, a psychologist and Buddhist says, practice generosity. Much ill will comes when we feel taken from or not given to or on the receiving end of another person's bad moment. Instead, consider letting the person have what they took, their victory, their bit of money, or time. Let them have their bad moment. Make a gift of forbearance, patience, and no cause to fear you. There are many reasons to be generous with a person I find difficult. First of all, I don't know what the woman's intentions were. I felt assaulted, but she may have been motivated by many factors that I can only guess at. She had had some negative experiences with vaccinations, so maybe fear drove her. Maybe her politics did. Maybe her need to prove me wrong. But I can't really know. Even if her motives were the worst that I can think of, I know she is who she is because of her instincts and conditioning. So I can forgive her. Indeed, I have forgiven her for my own peace of mind. Not forgiving her hurts me. There's no peace and there is such peace and joy in, in, in forgiveness. My mind and heart let go of resentment and other forms of ill will and glows with happiness. 
I have achieved some equanimity about this encounter in the swimming pool. Reading about goodwill and writing about it have helped me greatly. I now have a better grasp of what cultivating loving kindness or goodwill for all is about. And I'm even more committed to the practice than I was. Living with acceptance of what is, which includes the inevitability of suffering, knowing how important it is to investigate the situation thoroughly, exercising compassion and generosity. I can communicate with people better, those people that I find difficult, like this woman, because I no longer find them difficult, but suffering and confused, just as we all are. I cannot emphasize enough how important I feel this practice of cultivating goodwill for all is to end our divisions and for the improvement, perhaps the salvation of life. The poets say it best. In Naomi Shiab Nye's words, kindness is the deepest thing inside and it is only kindness that makes sense anymore in a world full of sorrow. Or as Michael Blumenthal puts it, it may be that kindness is our best audition for a worthier world. So friends, take whatever kindness you can find and be profligate in its, in its expenditure. Then, with Baron Wormser, we may say, the joy I invoke is Jibrilik's Jerusalem, the city we can build each day through kindness. The most sublime act is to set another before you. Let it be so. Amen. Please join us in um, saying the words for extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish, extinguish this, this flame, but not, not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I'd like to close with a loving kindness prayer. And I'd like to do this in a little different way. I, I'd like to, when I say a line, I'd like you to repeat it back to me. And I'm also gonna use some gestures. And if you want to, you can use those when you say the line back. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be filled with loving kindness. May you be filled with loving kindness. May, you be filled with kindness. May we be filled with loving kindness. May all living beings be filled with loving kindness. May loving kindness soothe and heal a suffering world. Go in love.